It's one week before my wedding. With a look of determination, my mother accosts me in the church hallway. Hannah, no, 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 no. You cannot possibly wear a plastic wedding band. What, what are people going to say? <laughs> They're just going to think Michael doesn't care about you. Hold on a second. Let me back up. You see, my engagement ring was plastic. To my mom, it looked like a ring from a box of Cracker Jacks or an old-fashioned candy shop. You know, the ones you can buy right beside Licorice or Pop Rocks. The truth is, Michael did care. In fact, he cared so intensely, he had painstakingly spent four months handcrafting the perfect ring for me in AutoCAD, then had it, along with an intricately designed box, 3D printed. Yep, you heard that right. My engagement ring was 3D printed. And better yet, it cost $7. <laughs> when Michael proposed, it stirred up passion <laughs> for a business idea. What if instead of the ring simply existing as a physical representation of our commitment, it could be immortalized? Jewelers could make the ring a virtual container of memories. At our wedding, guests could compose secret messages that uploaded into the virtual ring and could only be accessed at our one-year anniversary. Or better yet, the AI could feed us tips to keep our marriage thriving, kind of like a relationship coach. But none of these fascinating ideas occurred to my mom. All she knew, I had a plastic ring and Michael was a cheapskate. And she is not the only one. None of these native digital ideas have occurred to De Beers jewelers either, or most native analog companies around the world today. This is the perfect illustration of the true chasm between the native digital and native analog worlds, the clash of values and the clash of two categories of human, the native digital and native analog. What's native digital, you may ask? It's simply someone under the age of 30, and I'll use the terms Gen Z and native digital interchangeably. And a native analog is someone over age 35. And in this example, the significance of a ring varies greatly between these two generations. You've got me, a native digital. To me, a ring is a symbol that carries little inherent value, and it should be as inexpensive and replaceable as possible. You've got my mom, a native analog, and to her, a ring represents permanence, lasting love, a hand-me-down from generation to generation. And you have De Beers, a native analog company that's been making expensive engagement rings for decades. And if you don't spend three months' salary on it, you're the cheapskate. As a native digital, physical objects mean very little. To my mom, they're quite meaningful. And native analog companies like De Beers are still selling to my mom. And as a result, they're becoming irrelevant in the blink of an eye. I'm a 24-year-old Gen Z CEO advisor and the founder of Overture Academy. And for the past three years, I've helped leaders unlock the power of Gen Z by attracting, recruiting, retaining, and engaging the best and brightest native digital employees. After graduating college at age 18 with my bachelor's in international business, I was thrust into corporate America, but quickly exited, as many Gen Zers do, to build something of my own. In my work with leaders across the globe, many of them ask me this very scientific question. Are my kids aliens? <laughs> no, but the truth is it's nearly impossible to comprehend a native digital's mindset if you aren't one yourself. And yet understanding how to market to us and employ us is critical for your business to survive. This year, native digitals outnumbered native analogs for the first time, and by 2025, a projected 27% of all your employees will be Gen Zers. We're at the beginning of a mass extinction event of analog companies, and here's why. Most businesses don't understand that Gen Z is not just another generation. We're a new category of human. My peers grew up 
completely integrated with technology. Our digital lives are primary. Our analog lives are secondary. There have never been humans 100% integrated with machines until now. We're not just being digitally transformed like our parents assume. Rather, we work, think, and play starting from an entirely different perspective. For this reason, I believe that if you don't have a native digital on your board of directors, your leadership team, or at least one you pay to pester you like a fly in your ear, your business won't be relevant in 15 years. But you can start changing that today by getting inside the mind of a native digital. To do this, we're going to follow the career journeys of two different people, Peter Analog and Sophia Digital. Both of these people have a similar goal, land their dream job in the car industry and make half a million dollars a year. Most of us are very familiar with Peter Analog's journey. At age 18, he attends the best university he can get into for his marketing degree and leaves with fifty dollars to $80,000 in student loans. He takes an internship and after graduating is offered an entry-level position at that company. Over time, he rises through the ranks until hopefully he reaches his career destination, then retires on his 401k. This might mean transitioning mid-career to a few different companies a couple of times, but ultimately, Peter's journey represents the latter we're all familiar with. His ultimate destination is as senior marketing director for Rivian Adventure Vehicles. But now, let's take a look at Sophia Digital's journey, which trades the ladder for a climbing wall where you choose your own path to the top. To get into Sophia's head and understand her perspective, I want you to travel back with me to high school. It's the end of the spring semester of your junior year. What was on your mind? Were you thinking about your career? Did your teacher hand out college applications just before the summer began? Now, in that same frame of teenage mind, I want you to now imagine you're Sophia Digital, and you're staring down at that college application in your hands, standing in the lunchroom line, but you face a dilemma. Should I go to college or not? You see, you've explored a few universities, filled out an application or two, but your heart just isn't in it. The cost is high, and worse, you've watched older millennials graduate with four-year marketing degrees and end up working as baristas. Bored, you slump down in your chair and whip out your phone. You pull up TikTok. The first video happens to be Daniel Isles, who at age 22 had just purchased his fifth rental property. Hmm, your creative juices begin to flow. The next video is Daniel Mack, who's stopping billionaires on the street and asking, what do you do for a living? And those same billionaires are inviting him, a nobody, into their homes. For a second, you think to yourself, gosh, there has got to be a better way to get a job. In fact, I'd rather just make YouTube videos. You dash down the road to your uncle's car shop. He spent years building his business, but failed to reach his dream of showing his collection around the world. Too bad. His business was always seen as a local gig. You share his passion for cars. So two years ago, you started a YouTube channel, and you've accumulated a sizable following of 50,000 subscribers. It started out just for fun, but you found that enthusiasts love your work. This year, you receive a press pass to the Amelia Island Concorde d'Elegance, the most exclusive international car show, simply because of the reputation of your YouTube channel. You have connections in the luxury car industry many could only dream of, and you're just 17. And what started as just a hobby has now given you the credibility you need to land a job, score brand deals, or simply continue creating content and traveling around the world as a digital nomad. Let's step back and take a broader view of Sophia Digital's journey. At age 16, she dual enrolls in community college to get her associate's degree out of the way. 
Why not? Her YouTube channel is what she plans to stake her career on. She graduates with no debt, and after building a brand for herself on YouTube for seven years, a rapidly expanding startup, Rivian Adventure Vehicles, reaches out to her for an introduction to their CMO. Sophia struts into the meeting and makes advertising recommendations based on the research and analytics she's done on her YouTube audience. At the time, Rivian happens to be hiring for a director of branding, and they invite Sophia to interview. And guess what? Sophia is hired for her expertise. Suddenly, 52-year-old Peter Analog finds himself on equal footing with 23-year-old Sophia Digital. You have two people who've ended up in radically similar places at radically different ages by taking radically different paths. And Sophia doesn't even plan to stake her career on this position. Her YouTube channel continues to make passive income, and she plans to be financially free in 15 years. Now, if you're the parent of a 16-year-old, you're probably sitting on the edge of your seat, red in the face, about to throw rotten tomatoes at the stage. <laughs> Trust me, I hear you. My parents felt the same way you do now. You might also be thinking in the back of your head, well, all this is nice to say, but who's actually doing this? Who would put a 23-year-old in such a high position of influence and rank? And my response is, the companies that recognize that over half of Gen Z wants to skip college, that we possess innate digital marketing skills, and that a native digital controlled world already exists. And the ones that aren't adapting, well, Gen Z will leave them behind to become gig workers, influencers, and real estate investors. Because, well, over half of us say we want to be entrepreneurs. Here are just a few examples of journeys like Sophia Digital's. Some of these Gen Zers have used the power of content to land dream jobs, while others have simply started their own companies instead. Jonathan Javier, at age 22, began posting content online in his niche. In just one year, he accumulated over 200,000 followers on LinkedIn to ultimately land his dream jobs at Google, Cisco, and Snap. Stephanie Sue, at age 22, became the lead director at Superposition, an organization bridging the gender gap in STEM. And Caleb Williams, at age 23, founded Better Wealth. His firm has millions of assets under management, he has over 20 employees, and he's an international speaker and best-selling author. None of these Gen Zers took the typical ladder path. Instead, they built paths of their own. Now, as you can see, there is a giant chasm between the native digital and native analog perspectives to reaching the same goal. But we have to build a bridge if we're going to shift to a native digital future. So if you're a business owner, a CEO, or an HR executive, and you're still using analog tactics, it's time to shift. Let me give you some concrete examples of what one of my clients, owned by a Boomer CEO, is doing to prepare his company for the native digital future. Instead of hiring students out of college, this CEO has become the university himself. He's founded an apprenticeship program that takes high potential high schoolers and after the three-year program, pays them six-figure salaries. Instead of giving lip service to his young people, his head of HR is 22, and I'm on his advisory council. And instead of hiring all full-time staff, this CEO is employing native digital gig workers who have their own businesses and add value and expertise for his clients. And as a result, he is a leader in the category data world. So, the big question, what can you do to become relevant to native digitals? If you're a business owner, I have a challenge for you. Host a native digital focus session. Invite both your board of directors and top Gen Zers from your team. Have them sit across the table, but flip the cards. Have the board of directors ask the Gen Zers their opinions on pending business decisions. You might be surprised what you learn. If you're a leader, 
on that next strategic project, make sure you include a native digital voice. And if you're a parent and your kids ask you the dreaded question, Mom, Dad, can I be a YouTuber when I grow up? Bite your tongue, don't shut it down. You never know where that content could take them. And I just have to say, second-rate YouTubers make a whole lot more money than second-rate college athletes. <laughs> so after being inside the mind of a native digital and gaining a glimpse of what it's like to see from our perspective, what will change about the way you do business, the way you parent, the way you lead? For my mom, she chose to recognize that a ring didn't matter all that much. What mattered more is that she loved her daughter and son-in-law, and that meant embracing a new perspective. But it also meant I had to recognize the meaning that this physical object had for her. And so, I'll have you know, I did upgrade my ring for my mom. It's now silver and costs $40. <laughs> and until De Beers uses my idea for a virtual ring, I'll stick with this one. <laughs>